Thank you guys. Brother Corn, great message this morning. Very needful. All right. So, we're starting in 2 Timothy, guys. This is where I want to preach out of. But the Word of God's a funny book where sometimes if you want to preach here, you're going to have to go and talk about other stuff. So we're never probably going to get to this, but I'm setting this up for later. But Paul says to remember who he's talking to, his own son in the faith, right? Timothy's got some understanding, but look what he tells him. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Everybody wants to talk about Paul's gospel, Paul's gospel. Let's start here, shall we? And what's he talk about? Two things. One, he connects Christ to that man, David. Corn preached on this morning that in the dispensation of fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are in where? Earth, right? We preach the whole family in heaven and earth. So he connects him back to David, and then he says he was raised from the dead. According to my gospel, wherein? That means wherein that preaching, wherein that gospel, I suffer trouble. And guess what? You preach like us, you're going to suffer it too. Because they come at us in all ways. We are troubled on every side, guys. Because of what we preach, we preach the resurrection from the dead. Christ died to give you His life. They don't like that gospel. It's crazy to me why. It's the Son of God's life that you can have justified freely right now. But they come against it. Paul suffered it. He says, they call me an evildoer because of this preaching. Even under bonds, they may lock us up. But the Word of God is not bound. He says, therefore, based upon that, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may what? Guys, get familiar with these four letters. The Word also has done so much in my understanding because we can draw from that. That is one of those words that gives us information we need. The fact that it says they may also obtain the salvation tells you somebody has already attained this salvation within its context. So let's go back, shall we? All right, somebody's got it. We need to go back. Where is it? Do, 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 do. Ding, ding, ding. It's that man, Jesus Christ. He's the other one that has obtained it. So what's the salvation? It's being raised from the dead. It's simple stuff, guys. If we just throw out what you already think you know, stop thinking yourself to be something. Just let the Word of God say what it says and believe it. You'll go very, very far. That Word's going to come up over and over and over in your studies, man. Just pause. When you see it, be like, what's He mean? Because that means there's more than one right? Christ has obtained the resurrection of the dead. And Paul's saying, I'm going through all this trouble being put into prison so that others may be raised from the dead. That's why he does it. In Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, that's what Paul preached. And it's what he always preached from the very, very beginning. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. So what is Paul's gospel? It's the gospel of God. He calls it the glorious gospel of God, right? Committed to my trust. That's what it is. And here you go, which he had promised what? Religion's already set sail by the second verse. They already cannot handle that that was promised before by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Israel of God over here, body of Christ over here. Uh, promise four. Right? I'm telling you guys, it's we got to just slow down and believe this stuff. It's going to take you really far. But Paul said that gospel is mine, and it was already promised before, and that gospel is concerning one man who... Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's God's Son, and He's your Lord. And there's two distinct titles there. But He says, which was made of the seed of what? There it is again. It's seed of David. Made of the seed of David, according to flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with what? 
according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. That's the exact same thing he said to Timothy. It's identical. It's just a little bit longer. Guys, sometimes in order to learn the word of God, I will set things aside, right? Because I don't know if you know the, the grammatical rule when you have two commas. It's very similar to a parenthesis where it's like extra information. You can set it aside and it will still read true. Declare to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. I do that stuff. I break things down, make them simpler, easier to, un to be understood. So in other words, declare to be the Son by the resurrection. Yeah. Right? It's that simple. That's what God wants you to know about that. And now, so what does that mean? Well... First off, I want you to get this power here. Declare to be the Son with power. That's very key to what he's going to teach. But he connects him back to David. He says he was raised from the dead. That is God's power. And then he says, I'm ready to preach. And what's he preaching? The gospel. There it is again. To you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto what? Boy, do you think you might know what he's talking about yet? Yeah. Unto salvation, everyone that believeth to the Jew first, also the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Where is that righteousness of God revealed, guys? In this preaching. It's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, we got to have a conversation about that just there because we'll look up here guys now listen you're welcome to criticize my messages that's fine but before you reject about what we're going to talk about this morning i want you to go look at this word just it's in your bible 87 times you go look at them all i did i want you to look up justice 28 times get busy with me guys i can be a helper of your joy but i can't do everything for you you need to go back to your Bible and look up justify 11 times. You look justified 39 times. This ain't that much, guys. You can do this in an hour. Justifying two times. Justification is only in your Bible three times. We're going to get to this word. Its first mention is in Romans 4.25 and then 5.16 and 5.18, just a few verses. That tells you its definition is right there. But you better already know what he's talking about in order to understand that. You better not get to this word and think you can go and define it on its own without any understanding of these other words, right? Because the just shall live by faith, right? We're talking about how a man lives his life. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. It says Cornelius was a just man. Joseph, Mary's husband, is biblically defined as a just man. And in my all my studies, it's a simple word. It just means he was righteous. Just, righteous, true. Whatever you want to say there. But this stuff is a lot more complicated than we've made it, guys. We got, remember when you got caught holding the bag that salvation didn't just mean from hell? Right. And you were like, wow, I actually have to go back and read context and find out exactly what he's talking about, right? Redemption. We found out you were redeemed at the cross, but we're going to be redeemed. The body's going to be redeemed in the future too. Complicated. We, I understand man wants to box things in and, and understand things simplistically, but sometimes you're going to trap yourself in that. You're going to build fences around your understanding. God's going to say, fine, I didn't tell you to do that. Go ahead and walk around your little fenced-in yard. You stuck. You trapped yourself. So all I'm asking you to do is, is just have an open understanding with this. Because you're going to find out these things are complicated. In Ezekiel, you have Jerusalem justifying her, city, her sisters, Samaria and Sodom. You have a city justifying there. Okay, look. Isaiah 5.23, the wicked, they're justifying men for reward in the such. So, okay, well, that definitely can't mean hell there, right? How about Job? It says Job was righteous in his own eyes. Job justified himself. That shows you there it's somehow connected to righteousness in some way. 
Galatians is what used to always trip me up. As a, as a saved individual who understands the gospel, I come over to Galatians and Paul says, if we, talking to the church, seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found to be sinners. Is Christ therefore the minister of sin? God forbid. And I'd be like, what on earth is he talking about? I'm already saved, Paul. Somebody preach this man the gospel. He's telling me now I got to seek to be justified. Man, I'm, I just set that aside. I don't know how to handle that because I know I'm saved. Well, Paul knows what he's talking about. We're the ones who are ignorant. He knows exactly what he's talking about. If a man's seeking to be justified, you're, you're seeking to be made righteous of God. At the end of the day, it's actually not that hard to define, guys. Timothy is definitely one of the ones where I can prove point blank period cannot mean anything that has to do with hell because it says great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. What in the spirit, guys? He was justified in the spirit. God was justified in the spirit. So unless God was somehow in danger of going to hell, we need to update our understanding, do we not? So the just, right? They shall live by faith. I want to put two verses side by side. Declare to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. Not ashamed of that gospel. Why? It is the power of God unto salvation. What do you think the salvation is, guys? It's being raised from the dead, amen? And that's what God is doing with this gospel. But after Paul gets to this righteousness of God, notice it's connected to the just. Righteousness connected to just, connected to salvation. He says they shall live by faith. This message is on a message of life. This is how we live, guys. It's through the faith of the Son of God. Paul said that. But the first thing he mentions after this righteousness of God being revealed is that the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. And he used to trip me up. I'm like, I thought we were talking about righteousness, Paul. Now you're talking about wrath. That is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is His wrath revealed against ungodliness. Okay, that must be talked about. You don't even know what you're saved from if you don't realize you're under condemnation of a righteous God against your evil ways. Right? So that's the first thing he puts your eyes on in this preaching. This is Paul's gospel right here, guys. And guess what? My point being is, you come into focus right here. It starts right now, man. Not in chapter 5. Not in chapter 3. Wherever you want to box yourself in. It starts right here. As soon as he says, I'm preaching, he's preaching to you. And don't, don't set sail and, and act like this stuff ain't important for you because you're already saved. You're not going to hell. You're going to miss your blessing, man. I'm telling you. Because this section now, this wrath being revealed will run you all the way to chapter 3, where Paul says, what then? Are we better than they? No. And no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles, they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none what? We're talking about righteousness, remember. No, not one. There's none that understand it. I don't have to go through it, guys. You've read that section, the mind of God towards man. It's a rough, it's a rough trip through the scriptures, right, of how God looks at it. At the end of the day, he, there's no fear of God before our eyes, but read it. But then he comes down to here, he says, Now, we know that whatsoever sings the law saith, it saith to them who are under law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Conclusion. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be what? Okay, well, that's obviously talking about this righteousness. He's saying through keeping of deeds, you cannot be made righteous. You cannot be justified in the sight of God, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Right? That's what he's driving at, is that you can't attain towards God in your flesh. You can only attain the condemnation of Him. That's his conclusion here. So now watch, this section is so important, man. I can't believe the Lord opened up scriptures to me. This section is for you guys, not just how we preach to lost people. Watch how important this is. 
the righteousness of God without the laws manifested, being witnessed by law and the prophets. I mean, that righteousness was back there too. God's always been righteous, whether you acknowledge it or not. The prophets acknowledged it. They knew it. But he says, the righteousness of God, which is by what? But notice, it's of a possessive word. That means it's Jesus Christ, faith, that the righteousness of God is revealed. By that one man, and it's unto all. What's he talking about? God's righteousness. Unto all means it's, it's upon you. It's, it's offered to you. Don't mean you have it, but it means it's there. It's manifest. But it says, and upon all them that believe. Those people actually have it. You get God's righteousness through the faith of the Son of God. That's for you, guys. That's important to you. Your whole life's going to function out of these passages. I'm telling you. Watch this. For there is no difference. Now, this from there, Paul actually showed me this. From that point on, it takes into account that, that you're saved, that you're righteous. Because for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely. So now it takes into account that you've been justified freely by what? Grace. It's grace. Okay, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare, here we go. Here's the purpose behind it. To declare His what? His righteousness for the remission sins that are past through that forbearance of God. Everybody wants to judge God as some unrighteous, evil. Why is there sin in the world forbearance? Because He's trying to give you His righteousness. If you'll just repent, stop relying on your own understanding and let God work. Amen. He's working in the dark, guys. All things are working together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Just let the man work. He's do he knows what he's doing, right? And he's declaring his righteousness to believers. For believers. Now watch. To declare, I say, when? At this time. He's given you two time periods. Basically, time's past, and at this time moving forward. God is declaring His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier. That justifier only comes up one time in your Bible. There's your definition. What is it? God. <laughs> He's the only justifier. That tells you right there what it's about. It has something to do with God and His judgment. When you go look at some of these, man, you're going to see judgment, 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 judgment. It's God and His judgment to declare His righteousness for the creature. This is how we're going to receive eternal life, guys. You've got to have righteousness. You've got to have God on your side. But that's what He's doing. He's declaring His righteousness that He might be that just justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And then Paul says, who's going to brag? Right? Man, you want to brag? Look what I just taught you. It's all God. You ain't had no part in that except to believe it. He says it's excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. And here it is. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by what? Without the deeds of the law. Now watch. This used to trip me up so bad. We conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And then he says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Rhetorical question. Yes. Of the Gentiles also, seeing it as one God, which shall what? And I'm like, Paul, I thought we concluded this. Dude, why are you still going? That used to make no sense to me. I'm like, then conclusion doesn't mean anything. Right? Because he's actually not done. That justified, justified. It keeps coming up, keeps coming up, keeps coming up for chapters. So what's going on? Well, obviously, he has not just concluded, here's how you preach the gospel to a lost man. Set that aside. Now I'll teach you something. No, the only thing that's been concluded here is how a man is justified. And it's by faith. Amen. So this is actually the start of Paul's teaching. You've got a conclusion. You understand how you're going to be justified. And now he's about to begin to teach doctrine based upon that knowledge. See, guys, this is, we, there's a real issue 
with us just taking the Bible and saying, okay, from verse 5 to verse 20, that's this doctrine, right? And I do that too, guys, because we want to understand things, but you will make errors in doing that. I used to have like brackets on this, but you know what you're going to miss? Let's keep reading. God shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then? Right? All this information to get you here. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we what? See, in my mind, I had this in its own section. Right? Romans 3.31 is over here. Romans 3.21 to 28. That's how I preach the gospel. That's over here. And you're going to miss it. Because these declarations of righteousness is how God is establishing the law through His church. Facts, man. We got to let God be God and update our understanding at all times. This is what He's doing. This is how, this is how God is reconciling all things back to Himself. It's through the declaration of His own righteousness through believing, through faith, through His grace, by faith. You see that? Really important for you to get this. I'm going to open up to questions if you want, because if I've already lost you, you can't be recovered from here. Because everything's going to build on this, guys. We're building a house, man. And so we're on the ground floor. If anybody needs some extra mortar questions, we got to get you established here. Yes? Could you just focus for a second on the difference between by faith and are they two different processes leading to the same product of justification? Is that accurate? It, I believe it's just dealing with the fact that, that Christ is the faith, right? Israel, Christ, God established the faith of the Son of God. We are justified by faith. But Israel rejected the Son of God, and they fell and went into blindness. And through their fall, salvation has now come to the Gentiles. So, that, so there's a process that we actually come through them. We are grafted into them. So it's... I, it's, I see him making a distinction between the two. Uh, I'm curious as to why he's making that distinction. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, there is a slight distinction. It's really kind of word semantics at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it's just faith. Because he even makes that point of, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not... It's just, it's one God. That, that's his point, is it's one God doing all of this, right? And it's, it's just through faith. There's, there's a, don't let that trip you up. It's the same righteousness declaring this through faith, through belief. The only thing God's tasked you with is to believe Him. Just believe the book, read the book, believe the book. And through this faith, God is declaring His righteousness. For the creature. This is how God's reconciling all things back to Himself through this one gospel right here. And so now, this wasn't what my message is on, guys. All I was trying to do is preach out of 2 Timothy. And then Paul gave me that one reference back to Romans, and then God just blew the doors off this epistle. All these early chapters just got opened up to me. I, I knew I had identified there was stuff going on in five that was deep. And it just, it just keeps going back and back and back. And then it hit me. Of course it starts in chapter 1. How could I possibly think it wouldn't? You know what I mean? But here's where we're at. Now, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to flesh I found? That never made sense to me. That comment. I'm like, what is he talking about? Obviously, he's talking about this establishing of the law through believers. So he says, all right. God is declaring His righteousness. We're going to need to talk about the flesh a little bit, right? What does the flesh have to do with this? Well, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's uh, imputation right there. He's been counted for righteousness. How? Through faith, he believed God. So that's how Abraham was justified. Justified, guys, just means declared righteous. It's actually really simple. And so that understanding has completely opened up 
how I view the Scriptures. Because I used to do like a dispensational chart with Paul, Romans 4, right? Abraham are justified, uh, he hath whereof the glory, right? Abraham believed and he was justified. And I'd put Paul, Romans 4, faith. And then I would put James 2 over here. And James makes that point, see then how that by works a man is justified? And, I, and I'd say, see, this is showing Paul and, and Israel and, and there's no relation. Er, error. That's an error, guys. All it means at the end of the day is declared righteous. That's how they're able, guys, you got to remember, they're using the same man. It's Abraham. It's, it's not two different people. It's the same person. So it can't possibly be teaching two different things, otherwise one of them's a liar. You with me? So what's it mean, preacher? It just means they were declared righteous. When Abraham believed, right here, God said, I've made thee a father. Abraham said, amen, God. Boom. God, just like this, God declared his righteousness for that man. Boom, there's a righteous man. Right? Declaration of righteousness. It was counted unto him. You with me? But watch, the story ain't over. Abraham believed God so much, God says, offer up your son, see if you really believe me. And Abraham, I do, amen, offered up his son. Guess what? Boom, declared righteous again. Why? Because he believed God. So there's more than one aspect to it, guys. You're actually, your whole life is going to be functioning forward, believing God and being declared righteous of God and Tomorrow, declared righteous of God again. And tomorrow, I'm justified again because I'm still holding on to the Scriptures and I'm still holding forth the Word of life. The whole, the whole Christian walk is being justified unto eternal life. That's what God's doing. So I, just, I love it. They're not at odds anymore, man. The Scriptures have been brought into a unity again with me. It's awesome. Yes, Adrian, it is a fellowship. And I won't go there. <laughs> anyway, now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. What's he talking about? He's talking about that counting of righteousness. That's the reward here. And he's saying if, if you have to work, then it's not God's grace. Remember back here, he's justifying you freely by what? It's grace. He's saying if you got to work towards it, and grace no more. But it's debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is what? There it is again. Right? Declared righteous. His faith is counted for righteousness, even as David, there it is again, also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works. That's what we've been talking about the whole time. Just sometimes you see it's phrased as slightly different. Counted unto him for righteousness is God imputing righteousness without works. It's the same thing. And the fact that Paul says David also described means Paul just described it here. Right? Because it's an also. It's an addition to. So this is blessedness right here. Being declared righteous. That's the blessedness he's talking about. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not what? Well, there it is right there. That's what he's talking about. How you're going to have God impute to you righteousness without works. Right? Now watch. It just keeps going, guys. It's so wonderful. It's not even hard to see. So that's what he's laying out here, though, is we're, we're talking about God establishing the law. And this is how he's doing it. And Paul's letting you know it has nothing pertaining to the flesh. The entire thing is through faith. It's all through belief. And he just keeps going. Cometh this blessedness. What blessedness, Paul? Everything you just laid out. This imputation of righteousness. Come that then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for what? Do you starting to see it yet? It's actually very simplistic and very basic. He's just brick by brick by brick by brick by brick. And that's why I say I, I, we got to talk. I can't lose you early or you can't be recovered later because the whole thing is flowing. All right, we understand that. How then was it reckoned? Was he in circumcision or uncircumcision? 
not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. He's going back, all this is going back to this. He's talking about what pertains to the flesh. Does it have any bearing to what God's doing? No, obviously, this happened when Abraham was in uncircumcision. That's his point. And he received, now get that part. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness. There's a seal there, guys. Abraham was sealed just like we are. A seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. I wanted to highlight that, but I didn't want to confuse you with too much color. But he's the father of all them that believe. There's a group. Though they be not circumcised, he tells you the purpose behind that. That righteous might, righteousness might be what? It's all the way back to here. This declaration. He's telling you how believers get that righteousness imputed to them also. But notice this first group is Abraham's received that seal of righteousness. You see that? But now there's a second group here. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also what? Well, that's different. Things that are different are not the same. You have two different groups of people there. Isn't that what I just asked? What's that? There's two different, two different processes for two different groups of people, but they have the same outcome. Isn't that what I just asked? Well, they don't have the same outcome. They have faith. You're getting two different points confused, though. We're, this whole thing is about God declaring His righteousness. This section right here, through faith. But here He's setting up, we're talking about the flesh. And He's letting you know that Abraham is this, He's the Father, He has received this seal of righteousness so that He, here's the purpose, that He might be the Father of all them that believe. That's one group. That's all of us. Everybody's in this group. One pride. Yeah, one faith here. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Right? That's why Paul later calls him the father of us all. But he's setting up. This is where I'm going with this, guys. Romans 4 is deep. It's deeper than we've made it. Because not only that, he is the father of circumcision. Guys, that should start running references in your mind. Paul says, beware of dogs, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and uh, have no confidence in the flesh. Amen. He's talking about, this is a different group of people right here. They are, he is the father of circumcision to them who also walk in the steps of that faith. You don't have to do that, guys. You can go home, watch Netflix the rest of your days, right? God's not going to force you to do anything. But what I'm telling you is there's all believers and then there's people who want to walk in the steps of Abraham's faith. You got to deal with the scriptures, man. I know people cannot handle that kind of stuff. But let God be true and every man a liar. This is it's the facts of the scriptures, that there is two groups here and it's important that you get that because that's where Paul's going in the next chapters. So you have people who are believing, and then you have people who are walking in Abraham's steps. He says, For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. What are we talking about? The promises of God. And just this phrase, guys, heir of the world is deep. It hit me this week because when God promised that to Abraham, you can't promise me anything at this present time. Do you know why? Because I have to die. I'm headed to a hole in the ground. What are you going to promise me? I'm dying. I'm dead. So God can't tell Abraham you're going to be heir of the world in his corrupted mortal state. Because he can't inherit it. He's going to inherit a casket. So this heir of the world is actually a promise of eternal life. It has to be. There's nothing else it could be. So what I'm getting at is these promises of God are actually about eternal life. 
And he's going to apply this to the church. It's important you see that. But he's saying that this, this airship, if you will, is through this righteousness of faith, nothing else. And it's going to build. For if they which are of the law be heirs, right? People have a problem with these words. It's in your Bible. Deal with it. We're talking about airship or whatever you want to call it. If they be law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, conclusion, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise. Might be sure to who? That's everybody. That you can receive that promise, that, that heir of the world, eternal life. That's what he's getting at, that it, you can have this through faith by God's grace and it's sure to you. It's guaranteed. He says, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also, there it is, which is of what? The faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So what are we talking about, guys? We're talking about God's righteousness, right? We're talking about God's promises and how we receive those promises and that righteousness of God. And the whole thing is through faith. He says... And he cords it to this, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Right? He didn't say, I've made thee a father of Israel. Right? He includes the world there, guys. Before him whom he believed, there it is, there's the faith. Even God who what? An interesting little descriptor of God there, ain't it? That he chose the quickening of the dead... Hmm, might be something to that. And call it those things which be not as though they were. That's what I was talking about. He called Abraham that father knowing he's going to die. Obviously, Abraham figured it out. Abraham knew he was going to raise him from the dead to inherit that stuff. So, but watch. Who? Talking about Abraham. Against hope, believed in hope. He had faith that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. That's the promise. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. It tells you right there how much he believed God. He's just like, yep, I know we can't even have children, but God's going to do it. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. What's the it? That faith. It's exactly it. Faith for righteousness. He says it over and over. Remember back here? Where is it? Uh... Here it is. But to him that worketh not, believeth, justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That's what we're talking about. It was imputed to him for righteousness, right? Remember, we're talking about that declaration of God's righteousness given to the creature. And he's saying it's through this faith. But here, I taught you all that to get you here. That's Abraham. But he's teaching Abraham so he can teach the church. Amen. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, who? Abraham's. That it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it, what? This same faith. To whom it shall be imputed if we what, guys? There's a condition on your behalf. You got to believe this stuff. There is a responsibility to the believer to amen, Lord, to believe that. And when you do, when you have strong faith in what God is doing, God says, bang, declares his righteous. There's a righteous man. You, you will be imputed God's righteousness. If we believe on him that what? There's the resurrection, Paul's preaching. It's, it's always the resurrection, guys. It was from the very beginning. It, it really is from, from the first verses. 
on Him that raised up Jesus from the Lord from the dead, who is delivered for our offenses. Now get to this. And, what's and mean? Means, means in addition to, right? Not only that, but this. And was raised again for our what? First mention of that word in your Bible. I know what he's talking about. It's not that hard to define. He's talking about justification. The word ication just means like a process. He's talking about the process of how a man is declared righteous of God, how a man has imputed God's righteousness in his life. That's all it is. It's just this little section. But what I want you to get, if you want a hell doctrine, it's right here. Delivered for offenses. Christ shed His blood on the cross of Calvary. He died on that piece of wood to pay His blood for your sins. That is delivering to death. That's what it means. He was delivered to death for your sins. There's your hell doctrine if you want it to be. But there's an and here. Very important that God not only sent His Son to die for you, He raised Him up on the third day to give you His life so you could have His righteousness right now moving forward. Amen. And because of that preaching, guys, I'm going to suffer trouble as an evildoer. I'm not marveling at it. It happened to the apostle. It's coming for us next. It's fine. The Lord will sort us all out one day. I'm not worried about it. But that's what this is saying. This is why I had to go back to Romans and teach this to you guys. We've missed a lot out of these early chapters. He's setting this up of this resurrection preaching. And so you're going to start to, it's just going to pop out everywhere now. It really is. Once I saw that it's all the way back here, chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 4, it's everywhere. Watch this. Because remember, the next statement past this is, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Why? It's deeper than just you're not going to hell. He mentioned you're not going to hell. But he said, now through faith, we actually can be declared righteous moving forward. Amen. I have peace with God knowing that. It's deeper. The Scriptures are always deeper. we got to keep going. Don't get stunted by men or religion. Just... Throw everything out, guys, and let God build you back, man. You'll do just fine. Now he's going to get into chapter 5. Watch. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. But he says, what? Much more. There's a much more to that. Being now justified by his blood. See, this also gave it to me. Because I noticed there's something wrong in my understanding because he just said he was raised again for justification. Raised again. Notice he put it separate from the delivering. And then just a couple verses later, he says justified by his blood. And I'm like, which one is it, Paul? It's both. It's both, guys. It's just we got to update these words. Much more being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Through him. Now listen, four. Here's his conclusion. This is, this is an explanation verse of these two verses. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled, all this, all the reds, the same thing. Don't get confused. It's all about Christ dying. We were reconciled to God by the what? There it is, remember? Delivered. Watch. Much more being reconciled, all that's already taken into account. We shall be saved, saved by His what? There's His resurrection. That's the resurrection life He's talking about. There's an and. He was raised again for our justification. You're going to be saved by the life of Jesus Christ. I'll give you one. You're like, well, I just don't know about that preacher. Sure you do if you read the book. It says Christ gave Himself for our sins. It's everything we're talking about here and here and here and here and here. He gave Himself for our sins, but He tells you why. That He might what? Deliver us from this present evil world according to the what? What's the, what's the will of God, preacher, to deliver you from this present evil world by the life of God's Son? 
That's the will of God, guys. Right here's the difference between by and through. Right there. Through him is the justification by blood. And through, I'm sorry, by his life is the justification being reconciled. There's a difference there. Okay, sir. By and through. Yep. Amen. That goes back to Romans 3. All right, sir. <clears throat> now, there's a salvation there. Yeah. If you don't think that being saved from the present evil world is, is a wonderful salvation, you're going to miss Paul right here. Because listen, this has details to it. Up here in Titus. For the grace of God that bringeth what? Salvation, salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us. What's the grace of God do, guys? It teaches us something. It better. Or you're under the wrong doctrine. The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness. Remember, the wrath of God was revealed against all ungodliness. And worldly lusts. We should live. We should what? Live. live. This is how you live. Soberly righteously and godly in this present what? This present evil world. Yeah. He's telling you how to, how to live in it and make it not so evil anymore. To live sober in it, godly, righteously. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here it is again. Who gave Himself for us purpose that He might what? Redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And look what He says next. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. That is a... He's saying, Timothy, this is what we preach this is what God's doing. He is purifying unto Himself a peculiar people. Brother, preach this gospel. You speak it. You exhort the brethren to take it in. Anybody that comes against you, you rebuke them, Timothy, because you have all authority from the Son of God given through this truth. And don't let anybody despise you. That's what he's getting at. This is the salvation of God right here, guys. And it's dealing with your current everyday life. Amen. It is. <clears throat> Back to Romans. Watch. Deeper, deeper, deeper. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. He's talking about Adam there. Another one of these much mores. They which receive. Remember, Abraham received a seal of righteousness. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in what? That shouldn't be a veiled statement anymore. It used to be to me. I'm like, what is he talking about? He's talking about how you're going to reign in life, right? These things inherit eternal life, guys. Godliness inherits eternal life. You're going to reign in life by one Jesus Christ. And he's going to explain the details here now. Conclusion. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men the condemnation, even so by... The righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto what? Justification of life. I understand it now, guys. It's the process of God declaring His righteousness, giving you life and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what it's dealing with. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Boom. Adam, so by the what? The obedience of one shall many be what? Made Righteous. You can tell you right there that this definition is within its own context. What's the definition of justification of life, preacher? Being made righteous of God through Christ's obedience. It's very simple stuff. And all that is how you're going to reign in life, in the current, and in the world to come. It starts now, guys. Christianity wants to just, oh, I believe the gospel. I'm not going to hell. All my wickedness is just put away. And then I can now just live in total vanity. Nothing matters. And one day I'll just get all the glory having done absolutely nothing. That's a fantasy. That's not a truth of God. There is responsibility for the Christian, man. Amen. 
But it's still a simple life. You know what Paul said? He said, continue, continue in these things. He said, be not moved away from the hope of gospel. Pretty simple. In other words, read the book and believe that book. Amen. That's all you really got to do. But while you're doing that, the world's going to hate you and come against you for it and speak all manner of evil against you falsely for the Lord's sake. But he said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. We're in great company, y'all. Amen. It's going to be just fine. So do a couple more slides. We're not going to get too far. Let's see where I'm at. 15. Yeah, we're not getting anywhere. Wow, it's probably a three-parter. There's a lot going on here, and I wanted to take my time so you guys get this. To see that the stuff Paul's laying out, man, it was always here. This is all about how a man receives that righteousness of God through faith. That's all it is. Next section, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through what? Unto something. It's eternal life. Paul calls it the life that now is and in that which is to come. It's godliness. It's what he said, exercise thyself unto godliness because these things inherit eternal life. But it's, it's by that one man, right? We, we, it's a life of yielding, guys. You just know what Christ's judgment is and you yield your members unto God. And that's what it is. And that's how God's grace is reigning today. Me and Corn were talking the one night. We had a, our favorite study app is the, the eSword, right? And I use it for phone and computer. It's my favorite out of all of them. And I said, man, we should like find out who made that program and just send them a, a love letter and a thank you gift or whatever. He said, man, I bet you no one's ever done that. I said, yeah, you're probably right. And then it hit me. That, what we're talking about, man, doing goodness and kindness and gentleness unto all men, that is what it means to have grace reigning. It's not reigning through lust. It's not reigning through you've done something dirty and God forgive you over it. It's reigning through righteousness unto eternal life. But it's that man's righteousness. I don't have those good things in me. God has put a new heart in me. I'm a new creature, right? Man is selfish to the core. I don't want to take time out of my day to write a letter to somebody I don't know, never will know. That's Jesus Christ doing that. <laughs> it's Him. It's His grace reigning through His righteousness, delivering and purifying the creature. It's a wonderful life, guys. And these things will inherit eternal life. Another series on Netflix will not, right? Right? But writing those people a letter, telling them, thank you, I love them, keep doing what you're doing, soldier, that don't inherit eternal life. Because that's the fruits of the Spirit that Corn was talking about. That's what's going to receive it, guys, nothing else. Conclusion, well, what should we say then? Because uh, it is logical. After everything Paul just taught about God's righteous declaration through faith, by His grace, then that, that means we can just believe the book and I can still and, and go drink and do whatever I want, right? As long as I... No. He says, what shall we say? No. We shall not continue in sin that grace may abound. That's not how it's abounding. It's abounding through righteousness. He says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So sometimes we start to make like this the start of Paul's edification for the believer. No, it started all the way back in chapter 1. I hope you guys see that today. <clears throat> know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? And now what he's going to teach? Here it is again. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. Why, Paul? That purpose like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should what? Walk in newness of life. Amen. What's he talking about? It's clear as day he's talking about being raised from the dead to walk in newness and life and righteousness of the Son of God through faith. Here he goes. For if 
We have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall be. We shall be also. There's that word also again. In the likeness of his resurrection. You realize how simple of a verse that is? And how simple of your life it should be? Paul just said the only thing you need to worry about is be dead, Christian. Because if you're a dead Christian, God is going to make you in the likeness of His resurrection. Because His righteousness demands it. Right? That's all you got to do. He says it to Timothy again. If we be dead, we shall also live with Him. Very simple stuff. But that's the doctrine. So that's why we preach Christ. That He, that he died he was buried, and he rose again. But a lot of people preach that. It's so plastic. It has no real meaning at the end of the day. That's actually a threefold doctrine. Amen. He died for you. Make it the hell doctrine if you want to. That's fine, because it is. He shed his blood to give you his life. You don't have to be under the condemnation of God. But he was what? Buried. Buried planted together. That's a second doctrine. He was buried and what? Rose again. It's a threefold doctrine, guys, that you have been forgiven your sins through that blood propitiation. But we also need to be made in the likeness of His death. And through that, that's Philippians 3 all day, right? Paul counting it all loss, man, to win something. Right? What's he say down? If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That's what we preach right there. Christ, the seed of David, raised from the dead according to Paul's gospel. The gospel of God. Let's see. I'm going to find a stopping point here, guys. We've got a couple more. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also what? There it is. He set it up all the way back in chapter 1. The just shall live by faith. Here's the nuts and the bolts. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more what? What are we talking about? We're talking about dominion now. What has dominion over you? But he's using Christ to teach. Christ, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Talking about how a man lives his life unto God. Paul teaches you how Christ did it. He was raised from the dead. There's no more death or dominion over him. But look what he says next. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves. He's saying, eat this in, Christian. Understand it, know it, absorb it. And now I want you to account that to yourself. To be dead indeed unto sin. Obviously, how many times? Once. He's saying, just like Christ did this one time, and you send it up, sat down forever. I want you to be dead to sin once, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see that? It's all resurrection doctrine. And this is where we're going in, the, in probably at least next week, maybe two weeks. This resurrection preaching. It's what Paul always preached. It's what he's always going to preach. It was from the very beginning. It's in the middle. It's in the end. In fact, it's in every epistle. It might be in every chapter, guys, if you really start looking for it. It's everywhere. I filtered out so much, and this is a 40-slide PowerPoint. Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. Every chapter, I'm telling you. Wherefore, my brother, and you're also dead to the law by the body of Christ. Why? That ye should be married to another, even to him who is what? He just hammers it and hammers it and hammers it. Once God opens up your eyes, to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, folks. Once He opens up your eyes, you'll see it everywhere. But the purpose behind that is being married to Christ is so that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That's what, this is about what God gets, guys, not just what we get. It's about Him. Look at this connector. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, not written not with ink, it's talking about that, but with the Spirit of the what? The living God. We're talking about life and righteousness and resurrection, power. 
This is the power of God on the salvation. Not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in what? Newness of spirit. And not in the oldness letter. I always be like, what's that even mean? Well, here's a good one. Who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth what? You're seeing it. You're seeing it. This is how God is putting a functioning, living Spirit into His believers. and This is how God is delivering the creature and reconciling all things back to Himself. It starts right now, guys. It really does through this gospel. Here you go. Oh, here's the, here's the crazy controversial one, right? There is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus. So yeah, people out there literally just put a period right there and they, they neglect the last 10 words of that passage. Of course they neglect it, guys. They neglected the last seven chapters. They really did. They ain't paying attention to what Paul's been teaching. He doesn't set this up here, guys. This is just a continuance. Remember the, the reason I, I don't want to click back through all the slides, but remember Abraham was the father of all believers and he was the father of circumcision to them who also walk in the steps of that faith. We didn't get here just here, man. This stuff was already set up four chapters ago and he's been hammering it and building and building and building. So I don't argue with those people. They're, they're conquered. They're subverted. They, they've let men or maybe their own hearts get in the way, but you shouldn't be confused right here what's being said. That the no condemnation is them who also walk not after flesh, but after the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit gives you life, right? It gives you righteousness. It gives you all these things. For the law of the Spirit of what? You're probably like, preacher, this is annoying. It's just the same thing over. Yeah, it is the same thing over and over and over. Because it's what God wants you to know. He really wants you to understand how you're going to have a functioning life in His Son. And it's through that one Spirit. It is one Spirit, one faith. Right? But that law, there's a law of a Spirit of life in that man. And Paul says, that made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. He's talking about back here that He was dead. He was held in death when He tried to serve God in accordance to this law, the law's wrath. He said, God sent His own Son, so don't have to be condemned anymore. He already did it. He condemned sin in the flesh. And He tells you why. That the righteousness of the law might be what? Fulfilled in us. There's, there are Christians out there that have such a contempt and a hatred for the law of God. Guess what? It had righteousness in it. Deal with it. You just can't extract it from doing it. You have to get it through this one man. Remember, that's what five was setting up. And this ain't a, really even a message on Romans, even though it ended up being. But that five taught you that it was through his righteousness. It was through his obedience that we received these things. But through that obedience of Christ, the righteousness of the law might be what? Fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You're walking after life. And it's, look guys, remember what we set up all the way back here. This is a good stopping point. That this declaration of God's righteousness is to show you how God is establishing the law in believers. So look at it again. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. So that tells you that everything from Romans 331 up to 8.4 is like the nuts and bolts of how exactly God is doing that establishing of the law. Guys, God is eternal. When He spoke in the Old Testament, it's just as true today. 
That was life back there. But man, through a weakness, right, a corruption, a law that's in us, we couldn't extract that righteousness of the law out of the law through doing it. One man had to come and do that for us. And so we're now fulfilling that righteousness of the law, not through works of righteousness, which we do, but by God's own mercy and grace, He saved us. We fulfill it through walking after that Spirit because it's living and it's in Christ. You with me? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for these great truths in the King James Bible, God. I'm so humbled that You even allow us to have these things, God. I pray for the people to receive this message with joy, not to rest the Scriptures, just to believe it by faith, and just to understand the simplicity that's in Christ, Lord. And sometimes religion has got in front of us. It's corrupted our understanding of these words, Lord. We've been beguiled by men before, words like salvation and redemption, God. Just help us to see that justification is just another one of those, Lord, that we have to let you be our authority. We have to let you define these things for us, God. And when we do, it's always deeper. It's always much more, God. We love you so much. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.